July, we're going to talk about the art of wine growing. Uh, uh, I call it the art of wine growing for dummies. I don't mean to be insulting, but just uh, let's just say for uh, for beginners. Uh, so I'm. Uh, the good news is I'm not going to assume that you know anything, uh, and I'll just start from the basics, and we'll talk about how we make uh, red wine, and uh, but first how we make white wine, and what the differences are, uh, and try to give you a, a little bit of insight into my world. Let's start by taking a look at a grape. I, I've chosen a red grape here, uh, and uh, almost all red grapes have the color uh, just in the skins. So that means it actually is possible to make a white wine from red grapes if we don't uh, allow contact with the skins. Uh, the skins have uh, uh, all the color, but they also have uh, uh, tannin. And that uh, now tannin is, uh, uh, it's the, uh, it's a mouth feel, uh, turns your, the inside of your mouth into sandpaper, but there's different kinds of tannin. Um, so if you were to bite down on a, an unripe banana or persimmon, that's a, got a lot of harsh tannin. But the tannin in grape skins is very soft, and so it's more like the tannin in chocolate. And so it's, uh, it supports the flavors and gives body and richness uh, to the mouthfeel. Uh, also, uh, in the skins are a lot of uh, berry flavors different uh, sorts of berries for different kinds of, of uh, grape varietals, and some other uh, flavors. Uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, has uh, a little bit of an herbal or bell pepper uh, character in the skins as well. Uh, now then, in the pulp, we have, uh, and the pulp is usually colorless. There are three or four grape varieties that have red pulp, uh, but uh, they're unusual, and, and so uh, uh, we find uh, flavors in the pulp as well. That's where the juice comes from, and uh, it tends to be uh, flowery uh, and uh, light and delicate. Uh, and then there's lots of sugar in uh, grapes. They have more sugar than any other fruit, uh, usually around 24% sugar. That's uh, you know, peaches run about 16%, tomatoes run around 8%. We call that sugar, uh, we measure it in grams per 100 grams of, of juice, and uh, that's called Brix, B-R-I-X. Uh, and there's also acidity in the grapes. It's kind of interesting that the grapes uh, have a lot of acid when they're underripe, as you might expect, and then that acid... Uh, particularly an acid called malic acid, which is the acid in apples, is, uh, is burned, is metabolized by the grape in order to get the energy to pump the sugar into the berry. Um, then we have in the center uh, seeds. There'll be as many as four seeds in a, in a wine grape. Uh, so they're a little different than the seedless grapes uh, that you may see at the store. And they are uh, full of harsh tannin. So if you bite into the seeds in a wine grape, uh, you're going to have uh, some harshness come into your mouth. And the inside of your mouth will taste like sandpaper. So it's interesting as a winemaker to try to think like a grape. We, it's a little bit like the Matrix. We're, uh, <laughs> you know, the grapes have their own ideas of what's going on, but... Uh, uh, we're uh, directing their energy uh, to our own purposes. Uh, so it's, it's worth asking, uh, what motivates grapes? What, what do they want? What are they trying to do uh, that we can, we can use that energy? And the, uh, the answer is that uh, grapes are strictly for the birds. They use uh, avian vectors to reproduce, and I want to show you a little bit of, uh, of how that came about. So I'm going to get into some evolutionary detail here. Please sit back and relax. This isn't going to be on the exam, but I think it's a very interesting story, and I hope you like it. Uh, so uh, according to the uh, scientific uh, theory, uh, the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and, and about as far back as 4.3 billion years 
we can see the evidence of bacteria uh, growing on the planet Earth. But it wasn't until about 650 million years ago that we got any multicellular life. So before that, it was just yeast and bacteria. And then we had this thing called the Cambrian explosion. And so uh, suddenly, uh, in the space of about 50 million years, uh, evolution gave rise to uh, all of the plants and animals that are uh, now present on the Earth, at least in their primal uh, conditions and uh, body plans, like uh, you know, two legs, four legs, six legs, eight legs, uh, and, and a whole bunch of others that uh, have died out. Um, so uh, the first time we've found uh, vitis, which is the, that's the genus of, of grapes, and the first time we found vitis uh, was about 180 million years ago, uh, uh, and that was in the dinosaur era. Uh, there were, it's a flowering plant, but there were, uh, flowering plants were not dominant at that time. It was dinosaurs, and they were mostly eating gymnosperm, or ferns. Um, so uh, that went on for uh, about 120 million years. Uh, and then what happened was there was a big uh, chunk of rock, uh, perhaps an asteroid, that, uh, and this is right about the time that the America and Europe uh, and South America and, and, uh, and Africa split apart. So the Atlantic Ocean started to be created, and the continents drifted away from each other about 63 million years ago. And right at that time, there was a great big chunk of rock that came down into the Yucatan Peninsula and put all this atmospheric dust uh, into, the, uh, into the atmosphere, is the way the theory goes. And uh, the Earth was in darkness for maybe a decade. And... Uh, the ferns didn't have very good seed longevity, and so they uh, sort of died out. And what came uh, to dominate was uh, uh, the flowering plants, uh, modern uh, trees, mammals took over from the reptiles. Uh, and so uh, in a very short time, the earth became uh, inforested, and there were all these tall trees around. Uh, took maybe a million years to get uh, the, all those forests established all over the all over the world, and uh, well, those grapes, which originally had been just sort of a little bush, uh, weren't doing too well on the forest floor, and so uh, they had a great invention, and the grape uh, came up with the idea that if it was being shaded, if it was in darkness, uh, then it would produce. Uh, clusters with no berries, and that gave it some, uh, the rachis, the stem of the grape was all there was, uh, and that's what we call today a tendril, and those tendrils uh, could grab on to the trees and climb the trees, and that's what grapes are really good at doing now. If you go out in the, in the wild, you can see trees uh, that are covered uh, with grapevines that have climbed all over them and, uh, and are uh, using the tree as a uh, as a kind of a trellis to uh, uh, to live on. And so uh, that happened uh, about 63 million years ago. And by, by 40 million uh, B.C. in Europe, which was now isolated from, uh, from America, uh, this uh, species called Vitis vinifera evolved as a sun-seeking tree climber. Uh, over in uh, America, we had our own grape varieties such as Vitis labrusca, that's the Concord grape, uh, started evolving in parallel at that time. And uh, those grapes learned how to climb trees too. Uh, now, fast forward to about 2 million BC, and in the last 2 million years uh, in Europe, there have been about 50 ice ages. So that means that there was a lot of snow and ice, and the only place that the grapes could really live uh, was up in the mountain valleys, all separated from each other. And in these small areas, a lot of evolution took place. And uh, practically all of the grape varieties, and there are just hundreds of them, uh, uh, came into being up in these mountain valleys and created a huge amount of uh, flavor diversity uh, 
but still maintaining uh, uh, the, the, the species. So they were all still Venus vinifera, and they could uh, uh, they they could uh, propagate sexually and and so forth. And uh, uh, so they're all still Venus vinifera, but uh, lots of different uh, kinds of grapes. Uh, originally, we just had Muscat, which is a white grape, and then we got all these all these other kinds of uh, grapes, first Riesling and, and Gewürztraminer and some of the other aromatic varieties, and we got some white varieties like Sauvignon Blanc, um, and then uh, red-colored grapes, which were easier for the birds to see, uh, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, and, and uh, so forth, uh, all evolving at that time. Uh, and in just the last five thousand years when uh, humans have been around we haven't really done all that much uh, we've uh, apart from some breeding experiments uh, we mostly have just picked the varieties that we like the most and spread them all over the world um, there are a few varieties that uh, came into being in the recent past Cabernet Sauvignon is descended uh, about 400 years ago in Bordeaux uh, from uh, Sauvignon Blanc and uh, Cabernet Franc, and we think that was done on purpose um, uh, by, uh, by a breeder. Uh, but we also know that there was a mutation in uh, Pinot Noir up in Switzerland uh, that created uh, Pinot Grigio, which is a, a pink grape. It's not uh, as dark colored as Pinot Noir. And then uh, later on, the, the Pinot Grigio, or he calls it Lulander, uh, evolved again and lost its other color gene and made a turned into a white grape called Pinot Blanc. So there have been a few changes uh, around uh, that man has uh, brought about or has happened in the human era, but uh, not very many. And uh, mostly it was all there when we when we showed up. Okay, um, and again, uh, all that uh, detail is not something you're going to be tested on. I just think it's an interesting story. And so let's uh, let's uh, look into this. Uh, um, like I said, it's a little like the matrix that the, uh, the grape uh, thinks it's in the primeval forest and it's uh, reacting to shade and sun cues. Uh, so I just want to take you through the wild grape life cycle here. Uh, so here's a grapevine re reproducing. That's it. <laughs> a little plop of fertilizer there uh, with a seed in it, and the grape uh, grows up, but it uh, it can't see the sun, and so it makes uh, doesn't make any grapes. It just makes tendrils, and it starts to climb on the until it gets up to the top, and uh, then uh, it can see sunlight on one of its buds, and that bud will then decide to make some grapes because now it's in a good position for the birds to be able to see it, and so it'll put some energy into making grapes. So the following year, uh, those grapes will, uh, will differentiate, and, uh, and they'll make a green cluster, uh, very tight, very hard. At this point, the, the grape is uh, about 12 bricks. That's half, again, the sugar of a ripe tomato, so it's actually pretty good eating. But the grape is going to do everything it can to keep the birds from eating it until the seed is ready. And so that's called cycle one. And then once the seed is mature and it can propagate, it's going to go through cycle two and it's going to enlarge and uh, turn into uh, uh, a big, uh, well-colored grape so that the bird can see it. And uh, at the end of cycle two, the bird will be attracted to that fruit, and it'll gobble it up and swallow the seed, and then uh, the cycle repeats. So in short, I want you to take a look at a, a little graph here, just very briefly, as it's just a, another way of saying what I've just said. Uh, that uh, we're looking here at the uh, rate of growth of different parts of the grapevine. And so 
when these are days from from uh, bud break, from when the from when the uh, buds swell and uh, canes begin to grow from the grapevine in the spring, uh, usually around uh, March. Uh, and so uh, the first thing is the, the shoots uh, grow, and then uh, there's some root growth after that. And then the, the yellow lines there is kind of double, uh, uh, you know, two-peak uh, growth curve. The first one is what we call cycle one, and that's when the berries are uh, uh, the cellular division. The berries are uh, are growing up to pea size, and they're still green and hard. Uh, and then, as soon as the seeds mature, there's something called verasion, and verasion is when the, the grapes start to turn color and uh, and uh, become. Uh, go from being a bird repellent to being a bird uh, attractant. And uh, at the end of that is when we will harvest them to make wine. Uh, so uh, just to say it all again, uh, in the beginning, the, the grape is trying to get the bird to leave it alone. And then in the space of six or eight weeks, very rapidly to uh, turn into an, attract an attractant for the bird, please come and get me. I'm uh, I'm ready for you to eat my seeds. So uh, the strategy is in the beginning that uh, berry is going to try to stay small and hard and low in flavor, doesn't taste very good, except that it will make certain vegetal flavors that we call pyrazines, sort of a bell pepper character, to fool the bird into thinking if it does to come to nibble on that uh, berry that it's really eating something low in nutrition like a, like a stem or a leaf. Uh, and uh, also very high acid, so it sort of burns the mouth of the bird uh, and not very much uh, sugar uh, comparatively uh, for the acid. So uh, the acid uh, masks the sugar. Uh, and the tannins that are in the grape are harsh, just like the tannins in, a, in an underripe banana. Uh, very unpleasant. And... Uh, and then it stays green, the same color green as the foliage, as kind of camouflage. And then uh, in this very short time, in cycle two, the, uh, all that changes. So berries get bigger and plumper and softer, uh, and uh, hundreds of flavor compounds are produced, fruity flavors, flowery flavors that are very attractive, and those bell pepper veggie flavors are lost. Uh, and then, isn't this clever, the uh, acid, uh, the malic acid, is actually burned up in order to get energy to, uh, to bring the, uh, uh, to bring the uh, sugar uh, in uh, from the leaf, from photosynthesis, concentrate it in that berry so that it's uh, wonderful eating. And then the tannins change from harsh tannins to rich, soft tannins. Uh, so uh, they're more pleasant, uh, and then uh, the grapes uh, turn uh, red. Grapes are really practically black, and that's why we call call them Pinot Noir. Noir means black, uh, or even the white grapes change from green to gold. So Chardonnay and Riesling are much uh, they're much more uh, visible when they're ripe. All righty, so how do we make, uh, make this juice into wine? Well, uh, in general, we have a grape cluster has about 23, 24% sugar in it. The rest is water, uh, and it uh, tastes pretty good. But, uh, of course, in, the, uh, in ancient times, we didn't have refrigeration. We didn't have any way to, to uh, stabilize that juice, and so it would uh, start to, to ferment from the natural microbes, yeast, and bacteria that are, that are uh, present in the juice. And today we just add those. But anyway, uh, that stuff isn't very stable, and it's going to blow up on you. So uh, uh, there's also uh, fruity flavors in the juice. Uh, and then if we add yeast, we get what is called primary fermentation or alcoholic fermentation. 
and the yeast will convert that 23% sugar into about 13% alcohol, plus lots of bubbles. So the, the juice looks like it's boiling. There's so much uh, CO2 being evolved, and uh, lots more yeast. The yeast grow up uh, uh, during the fermentation uh, in order to make the fermentation happen. And then uh, there's a lot of heat produced, which we need to remove with a refrigeration system. Uh, some of the ancients used to, to bury their uh, crocks of uh, their, their earthenware vessels in, in the ground to take up the heat of fermentation. Uh, and we have uh, amazing flavor transformations that liberate a lot of flavors that weren't in the juice. So we make something very special. Uh, now, yeast uh, were only discovered uh, by Louis Pasteur in uh, 1857. He did an experiment that proved that there was uh, a microbe. Before that, we just thought we thought it was spontaneous generation. We thought that the juice was just doing it on its own, and he proved that that wasn't true. And uh, those yeast look uh, sort of like that. Here you can see the little bud scars because when yeast... Uh, are uh, budding, uh, and uh, here you can see one that's just popping off. This is the mother cell, and here's a baby, a daughter cell. Uh, and uh, later on, when it uh, grows and, and leaves the mother, then it'll leave another one of these bud scars behind. That's what they look like under an electron microscope. But when you see yeast, uh, you're used to it looking sort of like that. Usually it's dried into granules and uh, very similar to the yeast that's used in, in baking that you might have used in your kitchen. So uh, we have, uh, I'm going to talk about white wine and then red wine, and uh, there are really two different styles of white wine that are primarily uh, uh, on the market today, and one uh, is uh, what I'll call fresh wines. So they are, uh, they have very flowery flavors, and they're very low in tannins. So they're not very harsh, they're very soft and smooth. Uh, usually have a fairly firm acidity, and so they're good for uh, uh, with food because they cleanse the palate. That acid makes us uh, salivate and uh, clean the palate. Uh, uh, when uh, we pick the grapes, we usually pick them at moderate ripeness uh, so that we don't get too much alcohol and uh, can make uh, a delicate wine that's uh, good with food. And uh, we'll press them very gently so we don't get too much tannin uh, in the juice, uh, especially in dry wines. And, and, and we'll also ferment them uh, cold so that we keep the, the fruity and flowery flavors. And then uh, uh, very simply, we, uh, we uh, filter them and bottle them as soon as we can. We don't want these wines to develop uh, any complexities. We just want to present those fruity flavors uh, from the fermentation. They're generally uh, fermented in stainless steel. And then as soon as the dust settles, we'll filter them and bottle them, and they're meant to be consumed very young. They're not generally um, meant to improve with age. Now there's another kind of white wine style that's principally associated with Chardonnay, and that is uh, a mature wine. So here we do things a little bit differently. Uh, we like them for their rich body and complex flavors, a sort of a structured mouthfeel. Uh, and they have relatively low to moderate acidity. We still want them to be fresh, don't want them to be oxidized, which means they'd be brown, nutty, uh, stale. Uh, we don't want that, uh, but we do want something a little in that direction uh, where we're not, uh, where the wine isn't just simple and fresh and fruity, it has some other flavors. So the way we make those wines, uh, is that we get a little more ripeness, so they generally have a little more alcohol, they're rich. Uh, we might let them have some contact with the skins, 
so that uh, we get a little tannin and uh, and we uh, don't press them quite as gently. We don't mind getting a little tannin squeezed out of those grapes uh, for body. Uh, they will spend some time in the barrel and yeast leaves and uh, the leaves are the uh, sediment of yeast that can coat the tannins uh, and, and soften the tannins and give us a uh, full body. And we may take them through what's called a malolactic fermentation, which is a bacterial fermentation that I'll, I'll show you. So there's a lot more flavor development going on, flavors from the barrels, flavors from the microbes, and, and also more structure and richness. So we want to have a nice, fat, full-flavored wine here with a, a lot of interesting flavors. All right, so let's talk about how white wine is made. We're going to need a fermentation tank, usually stainless steel, but it could be a tank made from wood. Uh, the term tank means a big thing, <laughs> whereas a barrel is a small thing, usually 60 gallons. Tanks can run anywhere from 1,000 to 100,000 gallons. Uh, so a tank is to a barrel as a ship is to a boat. Uh, and we don't really use the term uh, keg, uh, and we don't really use the term vat very much. It's pretty much tanks and barrels. All right, so here's our tank ready to receive uh, juice. And we'll have a wine press. Now, a press is just a big strainer that has some kind of mechanism for squeezing the grapes and getting all the juice out of them inside of that strainer. And I'm showing a traditional vertical basket press here that was invented by the Romans. And we're going to need a little truck. And then here come the grapes, and we will smash them. And uh, what that will give us is, is uh, must, that is to say, uh, crushed grapes, skins, seeds, and juice, and we'll uh, de-stem uh, with a machine that will knock off the berries off of the off of the stems, and those will go into that little truck we've got, and then the must will be pressed in our wine press to separate out the skins and seeds and uh, give us juice for our tank. Then the skins and seeds are. Uh, taken away along with the stems and usually disc into the vineyard or uh, uh, recycled into compost. All righty, so now we've got our uh, fermentation this uh, fermentation tank. Uh, I'm going to show you a bunch of different ones. Uh, that's kind of your basic setup there. Uh, of course, there are lots of people around as well, uh, and uh, they're going to be monitoring the juice uh, when it comes in and the fermentation as it proceeds. Uh, so the tanks have lots of uh, valves and sampling valves and, and uh, places to uh, fill up and empty and doors to go in and, and clean out. Uh, then uh, here's an example of a cellar with wooden tanks uh, and some activity in the center aisle there. And then uh, here are some uh, barrel arrangements that are also in the, in the cellars. Uh, we often ferment those Chardonnays in the uh, oak barrels and uh, uh, in those little 60 gallon barrels in order to get uh, more flavor uh, and uh, interesting flavor changes from that in-barrel fermentation. So uh, you may notice uh, these little dimples on the jackets, and those are where uh, uh, refrigeration, either glycol or some other refrigerant, is being pumped. Uh, and then uh, you'll notice also on the face of the tanks are little controls which allow the uh, temperature to be regulated uh, so that we like to ferment uh, different wines at different temperatures uh, in order to control 
uh, how much fruit is produced, how much uh, extraction uh, uh, is made. And so uh, reds and whites are fermented at uh, different temperatures because we have different goals. All righty, so here's our white juice in that tank. And uh, we're going to add yeast to it. And uh, it's going to produce CO2. And we're going to control that fermentation, usually between 50 and 60 degrees. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And that will retain uh, fruity flavors in the juice. And the winemaker makes up uh, his decision or her decision about just uh, how cold to ferment that particular wine for the style that he or she is trying to produce. All righty. Uh, now, we have a choice. We can turn that uh, refrigeration down and chill the wine until the yeast fermentation stops. And we can arrest the fermentation so that we're left with some sugar in the wine. And if we then uh, sterile filter that wine, we can, uh, we can make sweet wines um, that don't have a complete alcoholic fermentation. That's very common in muscats and Rieslings and Gewürztraminers. Um, now, we can also make uh, fresh wines that are fermented uh, entirely dry, and this is more the tradition for Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, still make simple fresh wines that are bottled immediately but are intended to be dry uh, for different use, uh, uh, usually for, uh, um, well, dry wines are good, I think, with, with seafood, with crab, and, and uh and uh, oysters and, and lobster and so forth. And uh, so they have a little more uh, apparent acidity, and that helps to uh, cleanse the palate uh, when we have a mouthful of rich uh, seafood. Uh, all right, so then uh, there's this uh, other idea of mature white wines, and there we'll put them through what is called a malolactic fermentation. It's called that because the malic acid is converted by bacteria into lactic acid. Uh, lactic acid uh, is the acid in, in uh, yogurt, and it has less acidity than malic acid. And so this is a way of softening the wine. There are several reasons why we do this. Uh, one is the, the softening, uh, so the wine has less acidity and has, uh, that makes it rounder and fatter on the mouth. And the second reason is to give the complexity of flavors. Uh, the same bacteria that makes uh, buttermilk, uh, yogurt, and uh, many other fermented foods, uh, even salami, uh, is uh, what's called a, a lactic acid bacteria. And uh, these are used to complete the malolactic fermentation. And they give flavors of their own, um, in particular, a buttery flavor called diacetyl. And that buttery flavor is uh, very characteristic of certain kinds of Chardonnay. Uh, and then the other reason to do it is that uh, uh, it stabilizes the wine so that we can put it in a barrel and it won't uh, go through any further microbial uh, development. So uh, Chardonnays generally are put into uh, into oak barrels uh, for something like four to ten months as a general rule. And there they get uh, the flavors of the barrel as well. So that might be uh, vanilla, uh, some spices like uh, clove and uh, uh and uh, some toasty aromas um, like uh, toasted almond, uh, coffee, um, uh, many uh, uh, sort of spicy flavors that, that we get, uh, and also the development of some nutty characteristics that come from the interaction of the wine with oxygen, which slowly, slowly comes in through the skin of the barrel. Uh, and will uh, add to a kind of a cashew uh, nuttiness uh, that makes the palate richer and softer and more complex. When all of that uh, is done to the uh, satisfaction of the winemaker, then they'll uh, bottle those wines up usually uh, uh, a little later. They'll be bottled up in the 
late spring and, and summer, uh, generally in the bottle before the following uh, vintage year, uh, and, uh, uh, and then they'll be, be released for the Christmas season. Let's talk a little bit more about wood. Uh, It's traditional to age wines in old barrels. Some of them are from uh, uh, the United States and uh, some some from Eastern Europe. But the, the best barrels and certainly the most expensive barrels are from 200-year-old French oak trees that were planted by Napoleon to build a future navy out of. And it takes about 200 years for a French oak to be ready to make barrels. Uh, there's a terrific uh, video that I've put into your module. Uh, so it's, a, it's about uh, seven minutes long, uh, and it shows a barrel being made in a French cooperage. So I'm sure you'll enjoy that. Uh, <coughs> let's go all the way back to the forest, and uh, we have this uh, log that's been cut to about uh, a length of about four or five feet, and, uh, and then split open so that we can make uh, staves from it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that's where a stave is going to be taken, and we cut staves all around the radius. We don't use the bark, and we don't use the heartwood in the center, so there's kind of a, a donut of wood that's available to make staves out of. And, of course, that means... Uh, that if we take that stave, that we're leaving a lot of good wood behind uh, that uh, is just as good for flavor when we uh, cut out that, uh, when we split that, that log, we're going to have triangular pieces, and when we cut the stave from them, about 75% of the wood is wasted in making the barrel. And so I'm one of the proponents of using that wood to flavor uh, wine and to get oak extractives uh, so that we don't have to cut those trees down as rapidly as we do. Uh, this is very controversial. Uh, a lot of winemakers feel that they have to use the traditional barrel, but uh, I think it's much more environmentally responsible uh, uh, to do it the other way. And, and I think I make better wine. I think it's easier to control the toasting of an oak chip uh, uh, than it is to control the toasting of a barrel and uh, you can decide but it uh, does reduce the cost from uh, about uh, ten dollars a bottle to about 50 cents a bottle to use oak chips and I even use them in my hundred dollar Cabernet because I get so much more control and I also feel better about the uh, environmental impact. I do like to use uh, barrels. I just don't like to buy new ones all the time. Uh, they're very expensive. So I take care of my barrels, and I haven't actually uh, bought a new barrel since 1999. Uh, so I hope to get 20 or 30 years out of a barrel. All right. Now we're uh, ready to talk about uh, red wine styles, and there are two red wine styles, uh, sort of similar to the white wines, uh, where we have fresh wines. Now, these are principally uh, Nouveau Beaujolais and other uh, light styles, uh, where we're principally after just the berry flavors. Uh, they're uh, low in uh, tannin, uh, not real low, but they have a little bit of tannin, uh, moderate tannin, uh, and they will have uh, some acidity. And uh, these are great picnic wines. Uh, the favorite is uh, the George de Buff uh, Nouveau Beaujolais. is very popular. Uh, uh, and in order to make these wines, uh, we pick at moderate ripeness, and uh, we will do uh, skin contact. That George de Buff wine is actually uh, made without crushing the grapes at all. They're just stacked up in a fermenter, and we get something called carbonic maceration uh, that gives a very, very fruity flavor. Most of the wines in this style have some um, berries that aren't crushed, uh, which adds a fruitiness. Uh, 
and then we uh, press them gently so that we don't uh, put too much tannin, uh, and then we bottle them very quickly. There's a race uh, from Beaujolais to Paris to get the first Nouveau Beaujolais to Paris on November 17th. It's a big Grand Prix uh, race where, uh, where the uh, race car drivers are each carrying a, a case of Nouveau Beaujolais. Uh, but that's actually a very small part of the market, and most red wine is made in what I'm calling a mature style uh, that's meant, uh, usually takes a, uh, a year or two to be made and then is uh, drunk up uh, sometimes only after uh, decades in the cellar. So uh, here you get very complex flavors, not only fruit flavors, but also barrel character and the uh, aging characteristics that can be People talk about uh, cigar box and uh, uh, the bouquet, the old stink, a uh, little bit like uh, an aged cheese can have a lot of complexity and aromas, and uh, that's the sort of thing that we're looking for now. Not all wines are meant to be aged, uh, and uh, it does, you know, just because a wine is older doesn't mean that it's better. Uh, but the greatest red wines uh, are aged for for uh, uh, a decade or two. Uh, these wines have a lot of tannin uh, as a general rule, a very structured mouthfeel, so you can really feel that tannin uh, relatively low in acidity because acidity makes the tannin harsher, and so we want them to be uh, uh, n not to be uh, tart or crisp. Uh, Winemaking practices uh, we're generally picking quite ripe uh, or even on the edge of overripeness, and we'll do a lot of skin contact and extensive time in barrel to soften and develop these wines. All right, so red wines are made a little bit differently than white wines. We still have our wine press and our fermentation vat. Uh, but that, that fermentation vat is where we're going to ferment on the skins and seeds. We do generally take the stems off, but then we go straight to the fermenter before we press uh, and conduct the fermentation uh, in, that, uh, in that fermentation tank at a somewhat higher temperature. We need uh, 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit in order to extract the tannin and the color from the skins. And when we do that, kind of annoying that uh, the CO2 that's generated causes the cap to rise and so it's a lot more work to make red wine uh, because we have to get in there all the time and punch that cap down or we may pump over uh, two or three times a day to remix the cap and there are all kinds of strategies for for uh, remixing that fermentation all the time so that there's plenty of contact between the cap between the skins and the fermenting uh, juice. And that will generally proceed uh, pretty close to dryness. Uh, some wines are even left on the skins for as much as a month or two after fermentation uh, in contact with the skins to get even more tannin and development uh, before we take them to the press. So uh, now we'll uh, bring our receiving tank in when it's when we've decided that it's time to press based on tasting the wine and saying, okay, we've got the extraction that we were hoping for. So now let's uh, squeeze those skins out and we uh, drop the wine into a press, uh, separate out the skins and seeds, and now we have the new wine in the receiving tank. So I thought I'd show you uh, uh, a few visuals on what uh, fermenting and pressing red pumice is all about. Uh, this is the traditional uh, winemaking, uh, stomping the grapes with your feet, uh, jumping right into the fermentation tank and uh, moving, uh, breaking up the cap with your legs. And the French term for this is pigeage. Uh, so, uh, uh, we have our own version of that, which is to go into the tank and uh, 
and punch that uh, cap down. It looks like this. There's a guy with a punch down tool. You can see his feet right up there to the top right. And he's mixing that fermenting uh, must and, and uh, breaking up that cap and uh, encouraging contact of the wine with the skins to get better extraction. Uh, and we're constantly sampling the juice to make sure that it uh, that we've gotten the extraction we want and when the winemaker decides that it's time to uh, to press then uh, then the crew will go in and uh, empty sho usually shovel the uh, the skins out of the tank uh, and uh, either directly into the press or into bins where uh, which will then be forklifted over and dumped into the press to get the last little bit out of uh, out of those skins. Now there are many different kinds of wine presses. I'm showing here the uh, old Roman vertical basket press, uh, which is still employed in some wineries. And uh, then a more modern press here. So these are called tank presses, and there are uh, many other kinds of presses. Uh, when we press with a vertical basket press, we get a cake that's pretty solid, uh, and it's challenging to get the last drop out of that uh, out of that press cake. And so, in the mechanical presses, uh, we'll rotate and we'll have chains inside that will break up that press cake and allow us to get uh, better extraction. And uh, so, there's all different uh, kinds of beliefs and procedures for. Uh, breaking up uh, uh, that cap and just exactly how we want to press and the destination of the he of the pressed juice, which uh, as we continue the pressing cycle gets heavier and heavier and some winemakers will say, okay, that's enough in the best stuff and now I'm going to put this the rest of this over in the cheap stuff. Uh, for myself, uh, I kind of pride myself with being able to use all the tannin uh, and that involves very skillful use of oxygen to refine the tannins and uh, and uh, sort of basically turn cocoa powder uh, into chocolate. In other words, the the, the uh, tannins are rather crude uh, at first. And what the Aztecs taught the Belgians about chocolate making can be applied to winemaking too, which is that we use oxygen to uh, refine the tannins and turn them into soft, round, uh, drinkable tannins with a good uh, a good structure. So uh, once we've pressed the wine and, and now we've got in the receiving tank and it's it's dry, there's no more uh, uh, alcoholic fermentation. Well then at that point we can either uh, just uh, put that wine through a malolactic fermentation. This is almost always done with red wines because they're prone to doing it anyway and we don't want them to blow up in the bottle. And so the malolactic is done and then that wine is uh, bottled and uh, we put it in a race car and send it off to Paris. Uh, there are more and more fresh wine styles being made. Uh, some Argentinian Malbecs fall into this category of wines that are very fruity, uh, full of uh, I don't mean sweet, but they're full of strawberry and cherry and, and uh, bright uh, fruit and soft tannins. And so we are seeing more and more of wines that are only a few months old and are still ready for the marketplace and uh, easy drinking, uh, but a little simple. And then uh, for the richer, heavier styles, we'll also put those through malolactic and uh, those will spend uh, six to 24 months in a barrel, uh, sometimes even longer. My uh, crucible, my $100 Cabernet is in, in barrel for five years, so uh, that can happen. But as a general rule, six to 24 months for most, uh, uh, most reds. Uh, in order to get the oak extraction and the slow oxidation and marriage of the flavors together, and the integration into a uh, mature wine, which is then bottled uh, usually within a couple of years of vintage, though it can be more, but often 
these wines aren't really intended to be grown for several years. And so we have all different, a whole spectrum of different levels of maturity uh, depending on the, where the wine, uh, the grapes come from and uh, the grape variety and the style um, that the winemaker chose. All right. Now I want to talk sort of fundamentally about uh, white wine versus red wine because I'm not even sure that they should both have the same name. Uh, I'm a big believer in the, uh, in the difference between white wine and, and red wine. And uh, I'm going to put a little music on here to try and explain uh, what the what the difference is. So, so white wines, uh, white wines are beautiful. Uh, and the prime directive for a white wine is that it should be fresh. Uh, then also, they have a purity to them. They can be simple, uh, but they just have these lovely fruit flavors and, uh, and uh, aromatic uh, flowery perfume. Uh, that delights us. Uh, focused fruit, uh, usually rather simple, but just uh, really easy to understand and to like. And they uh, they try to be delicious. They try to just be lip smacking good. Uh, usually they will have a rather crisp acidity, particularly the ones that haven't gone through malolactic. And so they're intended to cleanse the palate. And this is the reason that they're often preferred for seafood, although that's not a hard and fast rule. Now the Romans divided uh, uh, the human consciousness into, uh, into daytime and uh, nighttime. Uh, uh, they talked about Apollo, the god of the sun, and the Apollonian mindset during the day. And I think this is where white wines belong. And so, as a general rule, they love sunlight. They, they're good lunch wines, and they, they like to be outdoors. And, uh, uh, and they tap into that part of the brain that, uh, uh, that's active during the day, sort of uh, logical, analytical, left brain uh, kind of uh, consciousness. Now, by contrast, the, uh, uh, the red, red wines are in a, a Dionysian mindset. I'll see if I can get us into that, into that frame of mind here uh, with, a, with another piece. Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's just try this one. Right, give me a second here. Uh, so this is more the Dionysian uh, 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 moonlight, uh, firelight uh, kind of frame of mind in the evening. And, and you know, Dionysius was, was Bacchus, and so he's the guy uh, that, uh, uh, he's, he's the god of, of, uh, of, the, of moonlight, firelight, starlight, but he's also the god of wine. And I do think that part of the popularity of wine today uh, has to do uh, with people having trouble getting into this Dionysian mindset because of electricity, because we have electric lights and we uh, tend to spend all of our waking hours in uh, artificial daylight. And so uh, we have a glass of wine and uh, that puts us right away into this uh, 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 more of a Bacchanalian uh, frame of mind. So red wines aren't supposed to be fresh. They're supposed to be mature. They're supposed to have complex flavors that uh, carry us away and are, are, are soulful and sexy. Uh, a whole different uh, idea of what a, a beverage should be. It's the, the reason uh, some people uh, say they just don't ever want to drink uh, white wines because uh, most white wines aren't very sexy. Uh, uh, Generally speaking, with the 
all the complex things that are going on in a red wine, uh, we want to have an integrated voice that brings everything together uh, rather than a, um, uh, rather than a, uh, uh, a focused fruit. We have a whole symphony of flavors, and uh, the job of the wine is to bring those all together in a very provocative way. Uh, and so rather than to be delicious, the wine wants to be profound. It wants to take us somewhere uh, uh, deep in our soul. Uh, they're uh, generally fairly low acid, round, rich mouthfeel, generous, but not crisp. And they're, uh, for that reason, uh, they're not considered uh, palate cleansers. And they, and they love firelight and moonlight. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, those are the uh, those are the kinds of wines that, that uh, carry us away in the, in the evening, uh, and uh, just put us into a different frame of mind. All right, just uh, just to let you know, that's that's the end of my presentation about uh, red and white winemaking, and I hope it was all clear to you. Uh, still to come uh, are some other uh, nuances of winemaking. Later on in the course, we'll be talking about rosés, both dry and sweet. Uh, the French drink more dry rosé than white wine, and I love dry rosés. They're not very well understood. We're going to taste one together and We'll have a lot of fun talking about that. Uh, Rosés are, are simply uh, white wines made from red grapes, and they're generally pulled off the skins right away, just like a, a red wine, and they can be made either dry or sweet. The sweet ones, most popular uh, of those that you know, are uh, white Zinfandels, which aren't really white at all. They're really pink uh, and uh, are, are used a lot like, uh, uh, like uh, sweet white wines. Then uh, we haven't talked about Dom Perignon's invention, uh, sparkling wine uh, in the Champagne district. And uh, we'll be tasting a Champagne together or a, a Champagne-style wine fermented in a bottle. And, uh, and also uh, we'll talk about some other kinds of sparkling wine. Uh, and we have yet to talk about fortified wines. These are wines where uh, during fermentation, the uh, fermentation is stopped by the addition of alcohol, uh, brandy usually, and uh, to make port and sherry. And then these wines are aged in a variety of different ways. We'll talk about those, those kinds of wines. Uh, and finally, the uh, dessert wines that are produced from the uh, shrinking of the grape by the uh, mold uh, botrytis, uh, now, botrytis can destroy a crop, but when the conditions are just perfect, it can make some of the most amazingly wonderful uh, dessert wines uh, that you'll ever taste, and we'll, we'll uh, taste one of those towards the end of the class, and it's, uh, it's called the, the Noble Rot. Uh, it doesn't taste moldy at all. <laughs> it tastes like apricots and honeysuckle, so uh, you're going you're gonna to like that. And uh, that's, uh, that's the end of the presentation. And uh, it's been wonderful explaining to you my work 